Love you guys. Check out the link on the profile if you don't know my blog yet. But I want to tell you guys about today's topic. So every day for until I finish the book, I'm going to read The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. Okay. Hi. How's it going? Hello, he has it going. So chapter eight, we're going to read today chapter eight of The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, The Investor and Market Fluctuations. Hey, Kalo, if you're not on my email list, go. Yes, financiallyfree.com. Go there. Yeah. And anyone else watching, I see someone watching live on YouTube. Yes, financiallyfree.com. Go there, put your first name and your email address on the right side. You get on my email list. And then I email out when I'm live, what I'm talking about. So it's good to be on the email list. Yeah, yes, financiallyfree.com. Not only that, I give a free ebook. Working Parents Guide to Financial Freedom. Now, KLO, you might not need that yet. One day you might have kids, and then you'll really want to know the information. So you might want to check it out anyway. It's free. Okay, so, but yes, financiallyfree.com. My name again is May Doldalow. Thanks for being on the live today. And the book is right here. This book is written by Benjamin Graham, and Warren Buffett studied under Benjamin Graham. Warren Buffett is probably one of the greatest investors of our time. So Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham, good to study both of them, yeah? So I'm reading this book because it was recommended by Warren Buffett, Robert Kiyosaki, a lot of people who said, if you wanna be an investor, you need to know how to invest intelligently. So that's why I'm reading this book. A little bit about myself. I am a, a full-time mommy, but before, in 2008, 2009, I used to work at a bank and I used to be really bad with money. I was a banking assistant. I made about 34000 a year before taxes are taken out. But I had over $40,000 of debt. In 2011, I calculated it was like 41000 something, right? It was crazy. Over eight different credit cards, lines of credit. And it was just very um, burdensome. Yeah, it made it hard for me to, like, I was like, how am I going to get off all this debt? You know, I had no assets at the time. I started investing in a 401k only recently, but not no real assets, didn't own property. It was just overspending. Yeah. By the time 2016 came, I had paid off all the debt, improved our family's net worth by half a million dollars. We're making about $500 a month in passive income every month. And I quit my job at the bank and I became a full-time mother, part-time finance freedom coach. And you can check out my services and look at my coaching program at yesfinanciallyfree.com under products. Okay. I became a full-time coach, started mentoring others on how to create passive income while paying off debt, how to learn to become an investor while paying off debt. So you don't have to wait. You know, a lot of people, you know, me included for a while was like, oh, I have to pay off all this debt before I think of saving or investing. And that's a really bad idea. Okay. So hi, Kazar, welcome back. So what you want to do is what I did and what I, I learned that from a lot of other people who were rich, they, they said, don't focus on debt, focus on Wealth accumulation, focus on creating as accumulating assets that create money for you. So I focused on that while I was paying off debt. So I created these finance freedom mastermind programs where I help people do the same thing. And went on a one month of vacation in 2017, went on a cruise to Mexico. First time I ever went on a cruise, it was my, my dream to go on a cruise. So I went on a seven day cruise to Mexico, went to Niagara Falls, Toronto, visited my family, I hadn't seen in years in Toronto. Um, and Buffalo, you know, visited family in Buffalo, my auntie and uncle. We went to LA, visited family there, and we went to Washington, DC. My sister lives there, right? So it was a really great um, time when we went to visit everybody and see the sites. My son had never seen Niagara Falls, right? So I was so happy to show him this huge waterfall, you know, so cool. And then um, we bought our first property, 2017, second property, 2018. Turn, um, both of them became Airbnb businesses in 2018, sold one to one of our mastermind members, and then we bought this condo here where we live in Waikiki. It's a beautiful condo. It's uh, twice the size of where we lived before this condo. So we're gradually upgrading our lifestyle. <laughs> and I live, I literally am two blocks from the beach, so we go to the beach a lot. We run around. The weather is beautiful here. You know, it's it's wonderful living in Hawaii during this pandemic uh, because we can go outside running, swimming, surfing, 
jogging, biking, you know, we have a lot of options. I know a lot of people have cold weather. We don't have, we have really nice weather. So, and uh, that's about it. So I want to let you know from that story that wherever you're at with money, maybe you're better at money than me. Probably are. A lot of people are better. Oh, hi, Kazari's on my Instagram too. Wow. You're on both places. You can actually talk to me on Instagram. You can talk to me on YouTube too. I think, well, anyway, so I remember you're from Pakistan. So uh, we're going to begin today and we're going to talk about this book. And I think it's good to focus on this book. Oh, my story, by the way, is just to help you guys understand that no matter where you are financially, you can improve your situation, right? You can go from all debt, not owning any assets to improving your net worth by half a million dollars, owning two condos. You know, you can do that even if you're just a banking assistant or have a lowly position that is not considered very prestigious or you're just an average person. So I just want to share that with you. And you can do it if you're a full-time mother. So being a full-time mother, I don't know if you guys are parents of children, but I'm a full-time mother. So I'm actually very busy. I, I cook a lot of our meals, right? And I clean and I organize school activities. And now that there's no school because of the whole COVID-19, right? I'm in charge of my son's school, <laughs> it's education. So I'm very busy, right? And you can still create financial freedom, even if you are a parent. And if you're a working parent, if you are very busy, it is possible and I'm here to help. And that's what I specialize in is working busy people. How do you become financially free? You can, it's doable. So that's the big story here. So that's why I wanted to share it with you. Um, so yeah, stick with me and become financially free ha, and healthy and all sorts of good stuff. Okay, so let's begin chapter eight. I'm excited. We're going to talk about market fluctuations today. Let's begin. To the extent that the investor's funds are placed in high-grade bonds of relatively short maturity, say of seven years or less, he will not be affected significantly by changes in market prices and need not take them into account. This applies also to his holdings of U.S. savings bonds, which he can always turn in at his cost price or more. His longer term bonds may have relatively wide price swings during their lifetimes, and his common stock portfolio is almost certain to fluctuate in value over any period of several years, as you guys all know with stocks and bonds, both fluctuating a lot in value recently. The investors should know about these possibilities and should be prepared for them both financially and psychologically. He will want to benefit from changes in market values, certainly through an advance in the value of his stock holdings as time goes on, and perhaps also by making purchases and sales at, at advantageous prices. This interest on his part is inevitable and legitimate enough, but it involves the very real danger that it will lead him into speculative attitudes and activities. It is easy for us to tell you tell you not to speculate. The hard thing will be for you to follow this advice. Let us repeat what we said at the outset. If you want to speculate, do so with your eyes open, knowing that you will probably lose money in the end. Be sure to limit the amount at risk and to separate it completely from your investment program. So um, when I started coaching Finance Freedom Masterminds and I showed my members how they could you know, purchase dividend yielding stocks. I think almost, I don't know, almost every one of them started speculating. <laughs> Even though I was like, that's not what we're doing here. We're not spec, you know, they would buy, they would hope to buy low, sell high, or they'd hope they got the hot tip, marijuana stocks are hot or whatever. I was like, oh my gosh. But it's just a phase. As long as you know that you'll lose that money, you know, I did it too, honestly. <laughs> but I, so it's like, it's hard not to start. I mean, it's like entering the casino and being like, oh, I want to play some games. You know, it's, just, it's really interesting, but it's gambling, guys. All right. We shall deal first with the most important subject of price changes in common stocks and pass later to the area of bonds. In chapter three, we supplied a historical survey of the stock market's action over the past hundred years. In this section, we shall return to that material from time to time in order to see what the past record promises the investor. 
in either the form of long-term appreciation of a portfolio held relatively unchanged through successive rises and declines, or in the possibilities of buying near bear market lows and selling not too far below bull market highs. Okay, Market fluctuations as a guide to investment decisions. Since common stocks, even of investment the even of investment grade are subject to recurrent and wide fluctuations in their prices, the intelligent investor should be interested in the possibilities of profiting from these pendulum swings. There are two possible ways by which he may try to do this, the way of timing and the way of pricing. By timing, we mean the endeavor to anticipate the action of the stock market, to buy or hold when the future course is deemed to be upward or to sell or refrain from buying when the course is downward. By pricing, we mean the endeavor to buy stocks when they are quoted below their fair value and to sell them when they rise above such value. A less ambitious form of pricing is the simple effort to make sure that when you buy, you do not pay too much for your stocks. <sighs> Easier said than done, but anyway. This may suffice for the defensive investor whose emphasis is on long pull holding. But as such, it represents an essential minimum of attention to market levels. We are convinced that the intelligent investor can direct, oh, he has a footnote, except perhaps in dollar cost averaging plans begun at reasonable price level. Okay. We are convinced that the intelligent investor can derive satisfactory results from pricing of either type. We are equally sure that if he places his emphasis on timing in the sense of forecasting, he will end up as a speculator and with a speculator's financial results. This distinction may seem rather tenuous to the layman, and it is not commonly accepted in Wall Street. As a matter of business practice, or perhaps of thoroughgoing conviction, the stockbrokers and investment services seem wedded to the principle that both investors and speculators in common stock should devote careful attention to market forecasts. The farther one gets from Wall Street, the more skepticism one will find, we believe, as to the pretensions of stock market forecasting or timing. The investor can scarcely take seriously the innumerable predictions which appear almost daily and are his for the asking. Yet in many cases, he pays attention to them and even acts upon them. Why? Because he has been persuaded that it is important for him to form some opinion of the future course of the stock market because he feels that the brokerage or service forecast is at least more dependable than his own. We lack space here to discuss in detail the pros and cons of market, market forecasting. A great deal of brain power goes into this field, and undoubtedly some people make money by being good stock market analysts. But it is absurd to think that the general public can ever make money out of market forecasts. For who will buy when the general public, at a given signal, rushes to sell at a profit? If you, the reader, expect to get rich over the years by following some system or leadership in market forecasting, you must be expecting to try to do what countless others are aiming at and to be able to do it better than your numerous competitors in the market. There is no basis either in logic or in experience for assuming that any typical or average investor can anticipate market movements more successfully than the general public, of which he himself is a part. So don't, don't, don't use market forecasts. There is one aspect of the timing philosophy that seems to have escaped everyone's notice. Timing is, a great psychological, is of great psychological importance to the speculator because he wants to make his profit in a hurry. The idea of waiting a year before his stock moves up is repugnant to him. Waiting, but waiting a period as such is of no consequence to the investor. What advantage is there for, to him in having his money uninvested until he receives some presumably trustworthy signal that the time has come to buy. He enjoys an advantage only if by waiting he succeeds in buying later at a sufficiently lower price to offset his loss of dividend income. What this means is that timing is of no real value to the investor unless it coincides with pricing. That is, unless it enables him to repurchase his shares as substantially under his prevailing selling price. In this respect, the famous Dow theory for timing purchases and sales has had an unusual history. Briefly, this technique takes its signal to buy from a special kind of breakthrough of the stock average on the upside and its selling signal from a similar breakthrough on the downside. Oh, I've seen those charts, right? They're like, oh, you have this, this like 
average line. And as soon as you break that line, it means there's a, there's a change coming. Yeah, the breakthrough. The calculated, not necessarily actual results of using this method showed an almost unbroken series of profits and operations from 1897 to the early 1960s. On the basis of this presentation, the practical value of the Dow theory would have appeared firmly established. The doubt, if any, would apply to the dependability of this published record as a picture of what a Dow theorist would actually have done in the market. A closer study of the figures indicates that the quality of the results shown by the Dow theory changed radically after 1938, a few years after the theory had begun to be taken seriously in Wall Street. Its speculator achievement sorry, its spectacular achievement has had been given had been in giving a sell signal at 306, about a month before the 1929 crash, and in keeping its followers out of a long out of the long bear market until things had pretty well righted themselves at 84 in 1933. But from 1938 on, the Dow theory operated mainly by taking its practitioners out at a pretty good price but when putting them back in again at a higher price, for nearly 30 years thereafter, one would have done appreciably better by just buying and holding the Dow Jones Industrial Average. In our view, based on much study of this problem, the change in the Dow, the change in the Dow theory, Dow theory results is not accidental. It depend, it demonstrates an inherent characteristic of forecasting and trading formulas in the fields of business and finance. Those formulas that gain adherence and importance do so because they have worked well over a period, or sometimes merely because they have been plausibly adapted to statistical record of the past. But as their acceptance increases, their reliability tends to diminish. This happens for two reasons. First, the passage of time brings new conditions which the old formula no longer fits. Second, in stock market affairs, the popularity of a trading theory has itself an influence on the market's behavior, which detracts in the long run from its profit-making possibilities. The popularity of something like the Dow theory may seem to create its own vindic vindication, since it would make the market advance or decline by the very action of its followers when a buying or selling signal is given. A stampede of this kind is, of course, much more of a danger than an advantage to the public trader. Okay, he has a footnote on if you had just bought and hold the Dow Jones Industrial Age from 1933, you would have done better than following the Dow theory. He says, but according to Robert M. Ross, authority on the Dow theory, the last two buy signals shown in December 1966 and December 1970 were well below the preceding selling points. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Welcome to the live. Let me know your name, where you're from. We have Kizar from Pakistan on. Okay, feel free to introduce yourselves. Buy low, sell high approach. We are convinced that the average investor cannot deal successfully with price movements by endeavoring to forecast them. Can he benefit from them after they have taken place by buying after each major decline and selling out after each major advance? The fluctuations of the market over a period of many years prior to 1950 lent considerable encouragement to that idea. In fact, a classic definition of a shrewd investor was one who bought in a bear market when everyone else was selling and sold in a bull market when everyone else was buying. If we examine our chart one covering the fluctuations of the Standard & Poor's Composite Index between 1900 and 1970 and the supporting figures in table 3.1 on page 27, that's going backwards. We can readily see why this viewpoint appeared valid until fairly recent years. Between 1897 and 1949, there were 10 complete market cycles, running from bear market low to bull market high and back to bear market low. Six of these took no longer than four years. Four ran for six or seven years, and one, the famous new era cycle of 1921 to 1932, lasted 11 years. The percentage of advance from lows to highs ranged from 44% to 500%, with most between about 50% and 100%. The percentage of subsequent declines ranged from 24% to 89%, with most found between 40% and 50%. It should be remembered that a decline of 50% fully offsets a preceding advance of 100%. 
Nearly all the bull markets had a number of well-defined characteristics in common, such as a historically high price level, high price earnings ratios, low dividend yields as against bond yields, much speculation on margin, and many offerings of new common stock issues of poor quality. Thus, to the student of stock market history, it appeared that the intelligent investor should have been able to identify the recurrent bear and bull markets, to buy in the former and sell in the latter, and to do so for the most part at reasonably short intervals of time. Various methods were developed for determining buying and selling levels of the general market based on either value factors or percentage movements of prices or both. But we must point out that even prior to the unprecedented bull market that began in 1949, there were sufficient variations in the successive market cycles to complicate and sometimes frustrate the desirable process of buying low and selling high. The most notable of these departures, of course, was the great bull market of the late 1920s, which threw all calculations badly out of gear. Even in 1949, therefore, it was by no means a certainty that the investor could base his financial policies and procedures mainly on the endeavor to buy at low levels in bear markets and sell out at high levels in bull markets. It turned out in the sequel that the opposite was true. The market's behavior in the past 20 years has not followed the former pattern, nor obeyed what once were well-established danger signals, nor permitted its successful exploitation by applying old rules for buying low and selling high. Whether the old, fairly regular bull and bear market pattern will eventually return, we do not know. But it seems unrealistic to us for the investor to endeavor to base his present policy on the classic formula, i.e. to wait for demonstrable bear market levels before buying any common stock. A recommended policy has, however, made provision for changes in the proportion of common stocks to bonds in the portfolio if the investor chooses to do so according as the level stock prices appear less or more attractive by value standards. Formula plans. Same with us, the last bull market lasted a really long time. <laughs> For 10 years, right? Oh, 10 years? It was long. <laughs> Formula plans. In the early years of the stock market rise that began in 1949 to 1950, considerable interest was attracted to various methods of taking advantage of the stock market cycles. These have been known as formula investment plans. The essence of all such plans, except the simple case of dollar, do, dollar averaging, is that the investor uh, automatically does some selling of common stocks when the market advances substantially. In many of them, a very large rise in the market level will result in the sale of all common stock holdings. Others provided for retention of a minor proportion of equities under all circumstances. This approach had the double appear of appeal of sounding logical and conservative and of showing excellent results when applied retrospectively to the stock market over many years in the past. Unfortunately, its vogue grew greatest at the very time when it was destined to work least well. Many of the formula planners found themselves entirely or nearly out of the stock market at some level in the mid-1950s. True, they had realized excellent profits, but in the broad sense, the market ran away from them thereafter, and their formulas gave them little opportunity to buy back a common stock position. There is a similarity between the experience of those adopting the formula investing approach in the early 1950s and those who embraced the purely mechanical version of the Dow theory some 20 years earlier. In both cases, the advent of popularity marked almost the exact moment when the system ceased to work well. We have had a lot a like discomforting experience with our own central value method of determining indicated buying and selling signals of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The moral seems to be that any approach to money making in the stock market, which can be easily described and followed by a lot of people, is by its terms too simple and too easy to last. Spinoza's concluding remark applies to Wall Street as well as to philosophy. All things excellent are as difficult as they are rare. Market fluctuations of the investor's portfolio. Every investor who owns common stocks must see to must expect to see them fluctuate in value over the years. The behavior of the Dow Jones Industrial Average since our last edition was written in 1964 probably reflects pretty well what has happened to the stock portfolio of the conservative investor who limited his stock holdings to those of large, prominent, and conservatively financed corporations. The overall value advanced from an average level of about 
890 to a high of 995 in 1966 and 985 again in 1968. Fell to 631 in 1970 and made an almost full recovery to, 19, to 940 in early 1971. Since the individual issues set their high and low marks at different times, the fluctuations in the Dow Jones group as a whole are less severe than those in the separate components. We have traced through the price fluctuations of other types of diversified and conservative common stock portfolios, and we find that the overall results are not likely to be markedly different from the above. In general, the shares of second, second line companies fluctuate more widely than the major ones, but this does not necessarily mean that a group of well-established but smaller companies will make a poorer showing over a fairly long period. In any case, the investor may as well resign himself in advance to the probability rather than the mere possibility that most of his holdings will advance, say, 50% or more from their low point and decline the equivalent one-third or more from their high point at various periods in the next five years. A serious investor is not likely to believe that the day-to-day -day or even month-to-month -month fluctuations in the stock market make him richer or poorer. But what about the longer term and wider changes? Here, practical questions present themselves, and the psychological problems are likely to grow complicated. A substantial rise in the market is at once a legitimate reason for satisfaction and a cause for prudent caution. But it may also bring a strong temptation toward imprudent action. Your shares have advanced. Good. You are richer than you were. Good. But has the price risen too high, and should you think of selling? Or should you kick yourself for not having bought more when the price level was lower? Or worst thought of all, should you now give way to the bull market atmosphere, become infected with the enthusiasm, the overconfidence, and the greed of the great public, of which, after all, you are part of, and make larger and dangerous commitments? Pre presented thus in print, the answer to the last question is an evident no, but even the intelligent investor is likely to need considerable willpower to keep from following the crowd. It is for these reasons of human nature, even more than by calculation of financial gain or loss, that we favor some kind of mechanical method for varying the proportion of stocks to bonds in the investor's portfolio. The chief advantage, perhaps, is that such a formula will give him something to do. <laughs> that is so funny. I'm sorry, that's really funny, because I remember when I started my Finance Freedom Mastermind program, and I was like, it really isn't that hard to start investing and creating dividends and passive income. You really don't have to spend that much time. What you really have to do is stop yourself from going in there and messing it up or speculating or just doing stupid stuff that loses your money. So we were reading, meeting, and improving our mind to keep our keep away from the stock market or whatever else. Like this is so true. It's like anyway. Huh. It is for these reasons of human nature even more, okay, as the market advances, he will from time to time make sales out of his stock holdings, putting the proceeds into bonds as it declines, he will reverse the procedure. These activities will provide some outlet for his otherwise too pent up energies. It, he is of the right kind of investor. He will take added satisfaction from the thought that his operations are exactly opposite from those of the crowd who are going crazy out there. Oh, so funny. Business valuations versus stock market valuations. The impact of market fluctuations upon the investor's true situation may be considered also from the standpoint of the stockholder uh, as the part owner of various businesses. The holder of marketable shares actually has a double status and with it the privilege of taking advantage of either at his choice. On the one hand, his position is analogous to that of a minority stockholder or silent partner in a private business. Here, his results are entirely dependent on the profits of the enterprise or on a change in the underlying value of his assets. He would usually determine the value of such a private business interest by calculating his share of the net worth as shown in the most recent balance sheet. On the other hand, the common stock investor holds a piece of paper, an engraved stock certificate, which can be sold in a matter of minutes at a price which varies from moment to moment. When the market is open, that is, and often is far removed from the balance sheet value. The development of the stock market in recent decades has made the typical investor more dependent on the course of price quotations and less free than formally to consider himself merely a business owner. 
The reason is that the successful enterprises in which he is likely to concentrate his holdings sell almost constantly at prices well above their net asset value or book value or balance sheet value. In paying these market premiums, the investor gives precious hostages to fortune, for he must depend on the stock market itself to validate his commitments, not the actual business value of the business. This is a factor of prime importance in present day investing, and it has received less attention than it deserves. The whole structure of stock market quotations contains a built in contradiction. The better a company's record and prospects, the less relationship the price of its shares will have to their book value. But the greater the premium above book value, the less certain the basis of determining its intrinsic value, i.e. the more this value will depend on the changing moods and measurements of the stock market. Thus, we reach the final paradox that the more successful the company, the greater are likely to be the fluctuations in the price of its shares. This really means that in a very real sense, the better the quality of a common stock, the more speculative it is likely to be, at least as compared with the unspectacular middle grade issues. What we have said applies to a comparison of the leading growth companies with the bulk of well-established concerns. We exclude from our purview here those issues which are highly speculative because the businesses themselves are speculative. The argument made above should explain the often erratic price behavior of our most successful and impressive enterprises. Our favorite example is the monarch of them all, International Business Machines, IBM. The price of its shares fell from 607 to 300 in seven months, 1962 to 1963. After two splits, its price fell from 387 to 219 in 1970. Similarly, Xerox, an even more impressive earnings gainer in recent decades, fell from 171 to 87 in 1962 to 1963, and from 116 to 65 in 1970. This is my son, Jordan. Do I say hi? Mm -hmm. hi okay. <laughs> he just woke up. These striking losses did not indicate any doubt about the future long-term growth of IBM or Xerox. They reflected instead a lack of confidence in the premium valuation that the stock market itself had placed on these excellent prospects. The previous discussions leads us to a conclusion of practical importance to the conservative investor in common stocks. If he is to pay some special attention to the selection of his portfolio, it might be best for him to concentrate on issuing sell on issues selling at reasonably close approximation to their tangible asset value, say at not more than one third above that figure. Purchases made at such levels or lower may, with logic, be regarded as related to the company's balance sheet and as having a justification in, or support independent of the fluctuating market prices. The premium over book value that may be involved can be considered as a kind of extra fee paid for the advantage of stock exchange listing and the marketability that goes with it. Caution is needed here. The stock does not become a sound investment merely because it can be bought at close to its asset value. The investor should demand, in addition, a satisfactory ratio of price to earnings, a sufficiently strong financial position, and the prospect that its earnings will at least be maintained over the years this may appear like demanding a lot from a modestly priced stock, but the prescription is not hard to fill under all but dangerously market, dangerous, dangerously high market conditions. Once the investor is willing to forego brilliant prospects better than average, better than average expected growth, he will have no difficulty in finding a wide selection of issues meeting this these criteria. In our chapters on the selection of common stocks, chapters 14 and 15, we shall give data showing that more than half of the Dow Jones Industrial Average issues met our asset value criterion at the end of 1970. The most widely held investment of all, American Tel, Tel, Tel AT&T, actually sells below its tangible asset value as we write. Most of the light and sh power shares in addition to, to their advantages are now early 1972 available at prices reasonably close to their asset values. The investor with a stock portfolio having such book values behind it can take a more independent and detached view of stock market, stock market fluctuations than those who have paid high multipliers of both earnings and tangible assets. As long as the earning power of, of his holdings remains satisfactory, he can give as little attention as he pleases to the vagaries of the stock market. More than that, at times, 
he can use these vagaries to play the master game of buying low and selling high. The A and P example. At this point, we shall introduce one of our original examples, which dates back many years, but which has a certain fascination for us because it combines so many aspects of corporate and investment advice experience. It involves the great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. Here is the story. A and P shares were introduced to trading in the cur on the curb market, now the American Stock Exchange, in 1929, and sold as high as 494. By 1932, they had declined to 104. Although the company's earnings were nearly as large as that generally catastrophic year as previously, the 1930, in 1936, the range was between 111 and 131. Then in the bi business recession and bear market of 1938, the shares fell to a new low of 36. That price was extraordinary. It meant that the preferred and common were together selling for 126 million, although the company had just reported that it held 85 million in cash alone and a working capital or net current assets of 134 million. A&P was the largest retail enterprise in America, if not in the world, with a continuous and impressive record of large earnings for many years. Yet in 1938, this outstanding business was considered in Wall Street to be worth less than its current assets alone, which means less as a going, less as a going concern than if it were liquidated. Why? First, because there were threats of special taxes on chain stores. Second, because net profits had fallen off in the previous year. And third, because the general market was depressed. The first of these reasons was an exaggerated and eventually groundless fear. The other two were typical and temporary influences. Let us assume that the investor had bought AMP common stock in 1937 at, say, 12 times its five-year earnings averages, or about 80. We are far from asserting that the ensuing decline to 36 was of no importance to him. He would have been well advised to scrutinize the picture with some care to see whether he had made any miscalculations. But if the results of his study were reassuring, as they should have been, he was entitled then to disregard the market decline as a temporary vagary of finance unless he had the funds and the courage to take advantage of it by buying more on the bargain basis offered. Sequel and Reflections. The following year, 1939, AMP shares advanced to 117 and a half, or three times the low price of 1938, well above the average of 1937. Such a turnabout in the behavior of common stocks is by no means uncommon, but in the case of AMP, it was more striking than most. In the years after 1949, the grocery chain's shares rose with the general public until 1961, the split up stock 10 for one reached a high of 70 and a half, which is equivalent to $705 per share for the 1938 shares. The price of 70 and a half was remarkable for the fact it was 30 times the earnings of 1961. Such a price earnings ratio, which compares with 23 times the Dow Jones Industrial Average in that year, must have implied expectations of a brilliant growth in earnings. This optimism had no justification in the company's earning records in the preceding years, and it proved completely wrong. Instead of advancing rapidly, the course of earnings in the ensuing period was generally downward. The year after the 70 and a half high, the price fell by more than half to 34. But this time the shares did not have the bargain quality that they showed at the low quotation of 1938. After varying sorts of fluctuations, the price fell to another low of 21 and a half in 1970 and 18 in 1972, having reported the first quarterly deficit in its history. We see in this history how wide can be the vicissitudes of a major American enterprise in little more than a single generation, and also with what miscalculations and excesses of optimism and pessimism the public had valued its shares. In 1938, the business was really being given away with no takers. In 1961, the public was clamoring for the shares at a ridiculously high price. After that came a quick loss of half the market value, and some years later, a substantial further decline. In the meantime, the company was to turn from an outstanding to a mediocre earnings performer. Its profit in the boom year of 1968 was to be less than in 1958. It had paid a series of confusing small stock dividends not warranted by the current additions to surplus and so forth. A&P was a larger company in 1961 and 1972 than in 1938, but not as well run, not as profitable, not as attractive. These are two chief morals to the, there are two chief morals to the story. The first is that the stock market often goes far wrong and sometimes an alert and courageous investor can take part 
take advantage of its patent errors. The others is that most businesses change in character and quality over the years, sometimes for the better, perhaps more often for the worse. The investor need not watch his company's performance like a hawk, but he should give it a good hard look from time to time. Let us return to our comparison between the holder of marketable shares and the man with an interest in a private business. Hi, Narashia. Welcome to the live. We have said that the former has the option of considering himself merely as a part owner of the various businesses he has invested in, or as the holder of shares which are saleable at any time he wishes at their quoted market price. But note this important fact. The true investor scarcely ever is forced to sell his shares. And at other times, he is free to disregard the current price quotation. He need pay attention to it and act upon it only to this extent that it suits his book and no more. Thus, the investor permits himself to be stampeded or unduly worried by unjustified market declines in his holdings is perversely transforming his basic advantage into a basic disadvantage. That man should be better off if his stocks had no market quotation at all, for he would then be spared the mental anguish caused by other person's mistakes of judgment. Incidentally, a widespread situation of this kind actually existed during the Dark Depression days of 1931 to 1933. There was then a psychological advantage in owning business interests that had no quoted market. For example, people who owned first mortgages on real estate that continued to pay interest were able to tell themselves that their investments had kept their full value, there being no market quotations to indicate otherwise. On the other hand, many listed corporation, many listed corporation bonds of even better quality and greater underlying strength suffered severe shrinkages in their market quotations, thus making their owners believe they were going distinctly poorer. In reality, the owners were better off with the listed securities despite the low prices of these, for if they had wanted to or were compelled to, they could at least have sold the issues, possibly to exchange them for even better bargains, or they could just as logically have ignored the, ignored the market's action as temporary and basically meaningless. But it is self-deception to tell yourself that you have suffered no shrinkage in value merely because your securities have no quoted market at all. Returning to our a and stockholder in 1938, we assert that as long as he held on to his shares, he suffered no loss in their price decline. Almost. Beyond what his own judgment may have told him was occasioned by a shrinkage in their underlying or intrinsic value. If no such shrinkage had occurred, he had a right to expect that in due course the market quotation would return to the 1937 level or better, as in fact it did the following year. In this respect, his position was at least as good as if he had owned an interest in a private business with no quoted market for its shares. For in that case, too, he might or might not have been justified in mentally lop lopping off part of the cost of his holdings because of the impact of the 1938 recession, depending on what would happen to his company. Critics of the value approach to stock investment argue that listed common stocks cannot properly be regarded or appraised in the same way as an interest in a similar private enterprise because the presence of an organized security market injects in equity ownership the new and extremely important attribute of liquidity. But what this liquidity really means is first that the investor has the benefit of the stock market's daily and changing appraisal of his holdings for whatever that appraisal may be worth and second that the investor is able to increase or decrease his investment at the market's daily figure if he chooses. Thus, the existence of a quoted market gives the investor certain options that he does not have if his security is unquoted. But it does not impose the current quotation on an investor who prefers to take his idea of value from some other source. Let us close this section with something in the nature of a parable. Imagine that in some private business, you own a small share that costs you $1,000. One of your partners named Mr. Market is very obliging indeed. Every day he tells you, what he thinks your interest is worth, and furthermore offers either to buy you out or sell you an additional interest on that basis. Sometimes his idea of value appears plausible and justified by business developments and prospects you know, as you know them. Often, on the other hand, Mr. Market lets his enthusiasm or his fears run away with him, and the value he proposes seems to you a little short of silly. 
If you are a prudent investor or a sensible businessman, will you let Mr. Market's daily communication determine your view of the value of the $1,000 interest in the enterprise? Only in case you agree with him or in case you want to trade with him. You may be happy to sell out to him when he quotes you a ridiculously high price and equally happy to buy from him when his price is low. But the rest of the time, you will be wiser to form your own ideas of the value of your holdings based on full reports from the company about its operations and financial position. The true investor is in that very position when he owns a listed common stock. He can take advantage of the daily market price or leave it alone. As dictated by his own judgment and inclination, he must take cognizance of important price movements, for otherwise his judgment will have nothing to work on. Conceivably, they may give him a warning signal, which he will do well to heed. This, in plain English, means that he is to sell his shares because the price has gone down, foreboding worse things to come. In our view, such signals are misleading, at least as often as they are helpful. Basically, price fluctuations have only one significant meaning for the true investor. They provide him with an opportunity to buy wisely when the prices fall sharply and to sell wisely when they advance a great deal. At other times, he will do better if he forgets about the stock market and pays attention to his dividend returns and to the operating results of the company. Summary. The most realistic distinction between the investor and the speculator is found in their attitude towards stock market movements. The speculator's primary interest lies in anticipating and profiting from market fluctuations. The investor's primary interest lies in acquiring and holding suitable securities at suitable prices. Market movements are important to him in a practical sense because they alternately create low price levels at which he would be wise to buy and high price levels at which, at which he certainly should refrain from buying and probably would be wise to sell. It is far from certain that the typical investor should regularly hold off buying until low market levels appear because this may involve a long wait, very likely the loss of income and the possible missing of investment opportunities. On the whole, it may be better for the investor to do his stock buying whenever he has money to put in stocks, except when the general market level is much higher than can be justified by well-established standards of value. If he wants to be shrewd, he can look for the ever-present bargain opportunities in individual securities. Aside from forecasting the movements of the general market, much effort and ability are directed in Wall Street towards selecting stocks or industrial groups that in matter of price will do better than the rest over a fairly short period of, of the future. Logical as this endeavor may seem, we do not believe it is suited to the needs or temperament of the true investor, particularly since he would be competing with almost a large number, done. almost honey. Logical as this endeavor may seem, we do not believe it is suited to the needs or temperament of the true investor, particularly since he would be competing with a large number of stock market traders and first-class financial analysts who are trying to do the same thing. As in all other activities that, em that emphasize price movements first and underlying values second, the men work of many intelligent minds constantly engaged in this field tends to be self-neutralizing and self-defeating over the years. The investor with a portfolio of sound stock should expect their prices to fluctuate and should neither be concerned by sizable declines or become excited by sizable advances. He should always remember that market quotations are there for his convenience, either to be taken advantage of or to be ignored. He should never buy a stock because it has gone up or sell one because it has gone down. Easier said than done. Oh, Kizar said hi to you, Jordan. There's someone from Pakistan on. His name is Kazar. He said hi to you. Hi. His name is Jordan. Okay. He would not be far wrong if this model read more simply. Never buy a stock immediately after a substantial rise or sell one immediately after a substantial drop. An added consideration. Something should be said about the significance of average market prices as a measure of managerial competence. The stockholders stockholder judges whether his own investment has been successful in terms of both dividends received and of the long range trend of the average market value. The same criteria should logically be applied in testing the effectiveness of a company's management and the soundness of its attitude toward the owners of the business. This statement may sound like a truism, but it needs to be emphasized for as yet there is no accepted technique or approach by which management is brought to the bar of market opinion. On the contrary, managements have always insisted that they have no responsibility of any kind for what happens to the market value of their shares. It is true, of course, that they are not accountable for those fluctuations in price, which, as we have been insisting, bear no relationship to underlying conditions and values, 
that it is only the lack of alertness and intelligence among the rank and file stockholders that permits this immu immunity to extend to the entire realm of market quotations, including the permanent establishment of a depreciated and unsatisfactory price level. Good management produce good produce a good average market price, and bad management produce bad market prices. Fluctuations in bond prices. Goodness. The investor should be aware that even though safety of its principal and interest may be in question, a long-term bond could vary widely in market price in response to changes in interest rates. In Table 8.1, we give data for various years back to 1902, covering years for high-grade corporate and tax-free issues. As individual illustrations, we add the price fluctuations of two representative railroad issues for a similar period. These are the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe general mortgage Fours due 1995 for generations, one of our premier non callable bond issues, and the Northern Pacific Railroad threes due 2047. Wow, originally a 150 year maturity. Long, a typical BB, BAA rated bond. Because of their inverse relationship, the, yo the low yields correspond to the high prices and vice versa. The decline in the new the Northern Pacific threes in 1940. Oh, really? How cute. Okay. A bulldog. Nice. Okay. Our neighbor is babysitting a bulldog. Okay. Your breakfast is up there on the counter, honey, if you want to eat and get your water bottle. Okay. Because of their inverse relationship, the, yield, the low yields correspond to the high prices and vice versa. The decline in the Northern Pacific threes in 1940 represented mainly doubts as to the security of the issue. It is extraordinary that the price recovered to an all-time high in the next few years and then lost two-thirds of its price chiefly because of the rise in general interest rates. There have been startling variations as well in the price of even the highest grade bonds in the past 40 years. Note that bond prices do not fluctuate in the same inverse proportion as the calculated yields because their fixed maturity value of 100% exerts a moderating influence. However, for very long maturities, as in our Northern Pacific example, prices and yields change as close to the same rate, at close to the same rate. Since 1964, record movements in both directions have taken place in the high grade bond market. Taking prime municipals tax-free as an example, their, year, their yield more than doubled from 3.2% in 1965 to 7% in June of 1970. Their price index declined correspondingly from 110.8 to 67.5. In mid-1970, the yields on high-grade long-term bonds were higher than at any time in the near 200 years of this country's economic history. 25 years earlier, just before our protracted bull market began, bond yields were at their lowest point in history. Long-term municipals returned as, as little as 1%, and industrials gave 2.4% compared with the 45 to 5% formerly considered normal. Those of us with long experience in Wall Street have seen Newton's law of action and reaction equal and opposite work itself out repeatedly in the stock market. Most noteworthy example being the rise in the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 64 in 1921 to 381 in 1929, followed by a record collapse to 41 in 1932. But this time, the widest pendulum swings take place in the unusually staid and slow-moving array of high-grade bond prices and yields. Moral, nothing important in Wall Street can be counted on to occur exactly in the same way as it happened before. This represents the first half of our favorite dictum. The more it changes, the more it's the same thing. <laughs> If it is virtually impossible to make worthwhile predictions about the price movements of stocks, it is completely impossible to do so for bonds. In the old days, at least, one could often find an, a useful clue to the coming end of a bull or bear market by studying the prior actions of bonds, but no similar clues were given to a coming change in interest rates and bond prices. Hence, the investor must choose between long-term and short-term bond investments on the basis chiefly of his personal preference. If he wants to be certain that the market values will not decrease, his best choices are probably U.S. savings bonds, Series E or H, which were described above, page, 40, page 45. Either issue will give him a 5% yield, not anymore, <laughs> after the first year. The Series E for up to five, five, six years. The Series H for up to 10 years, with a guaranteed real sale value of cost or better. If the investor wants... The 7.5% now available on good long-term corporate bonds 
or the 5.3% on tax-free municipals, he must be prepared to see them fluctuate in price. Banks and insurance companies have the privilege of valuing high-rated bonds of this type on the mathematical basis of amortized cost, which disregards market prices. It would not be a bad idea for the individual investor to do something similar. The price fluctuations of convertible bonds and preferred stocks are the same resultant of three different factors. Number one, variations in the price of the related common stock. Two, variations in the credit standing of the company. And three, variations in the general interest rates. A good many of the convertible issues have been sold by companies that have credit ratings well below the best. Footnote, the, three, the top three ratings for bonds and preferred stocks are AAA, AA, and A, used by Moody's, and AAA, AA, and A by Standard & Poor's. They are others, there are others going down to D. Some of these were badly affected by the financial squeeze in 1970. As a result, come on, I'm almost done. As a result, convertible issues as a whole have been subjected to triply unsettling influences in recent years and price variations have been unusually wide. In the typical case, therefore, the investor would delude himself. Come on. Honey. I am a full-time mommy after all. Oh, okay. Would delude himself if he expected to find in convertible issues that ideal combination of the safety of a high-grade bond and price protection, plus a chance to benefit from an advance in the price of the common. This may be a good place to make a suggestion about the long-term bond of the future. Why should not the effects of changing interest rates be divided on some practical and equitable basis between the borrower and the lender? One possibility would be to sell long-term bonds with interest payments that vary with an appropriate index of the going rate. The main results of such an arrangement would be, one, the investor's bond would always have a principal value of about 100 if the company maintains its credit rating but the interest received will vary, say, with the rate offered on conventional new issues. Two, the corporation would have the advantages of long-term debt, being spared problems and costs of frequent renewals or refinancing, but its interest costs would change from year to year. Footnote four, this idea has already been, has already had some adoptions in Europe by the state-owned Italian electric energy concern on its guaranteed floating rate loan notes. June 1980. In June 1971, advertised in New York that the annual rate of interest paid thereon in the next six months would be 8.5%. One such flexible arrangement was incorporated in the Toronto Dominion Bank's 7 to 8% debentures June 1991, offered in June 1971. The bonds pay 7% to July 1976 and 8% thereafter, but the holder has the option to receive his principal in July 1976. Over the past decade, the bond in investor has been comfort confronted by an increasingly serious dilemma. Should he choose complete stability of principal value, but with varying and unusually low short-term interest rates, or shall he choose a fixed interest income with considerable variations, usually downward, it seems, in his principal value? It would be good for most investors if they could compromise between these extremes and be assured that neither their interest return nor their principal value will fall below a stated minimum over, say, a 20-year period. This could be arranged with, without great difficulty in an appropriate bond contract of a new form. Important note, in effect, the U.S. government has done a similar thing in its combination of the original savings bonds contracts with their extensions at higher interest rates. The suggestion we make here would cover a long, longer fixed investment period than the savings bonds and would introduce more flexibility in the interest rate provisions. It's hardly worthwhile to talk about non-convertible preferred stocks, since their special tax status makes the safe ones much more desirable holdings for corporations, example, insurance companies, than by individuals. The poor quality ones almost always fluctuate over a wide range, percentage-wise, not too differently from common stocks. We can offer no other useful remark about them. Table 16.2 below, page 222, gives some information on the price changes of low-grade non-convertible preferreds between December 1968 and December 1970. The average decline was 17% against 11.3% of the S&P composite index of composite stocks. And then if you want to screenshot the table he was talking about, that's table 8.1, I guess, is talking about bonds, interest rate fluctuations with bonds. Okay? And basically, 
um, as the interest rates changed, bond prices went up or down, right? And since interest rates kept going up, all the bond prices went down because their interest rates were lower and they were worth less to people because why would you want a bond with such low interest rate? We get one with higher interest rate now. So uh, this was a new thing when he wrote this book, right? A new discovery. This we all know now that long-term bonds fluctuate in value. All right, we're done reading the chapter. Thank you for being here. It was a long chapter, just like last week, Friday, but we will continue on. Aloha. Check out the blog. If you haven't already, join the email list. Yes, financiallyfree.com. Check it out. Get on the email list. Put your first name, email address on the right side. Have a great day, guys. Aloha.